At one point, a full-blown uprising with bloodshed and murder broke out in Jiangidu province in Seoul. Zombies attacked everyone without exception. They were eating and tearing flesh, and their population was only growing. The media tried to warn of the danger on the street, while the military fired on the crowd of dead. The monsters were running to places where there was still living flesh. The order and peace in the world was destroyed. The real end of the world had come. In the midst of such a horrific picture, the survivors found themselves desperately fighting for their existence, not to fall deeper into the depths of hell, and not to lose their own humanity. Did you like the story and already want to continue? Like it to speed up the release and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss this and new stories. It was raining outside. A man stood in the middle of the empty corridor in front of the entrance. Nervously, he introduces himself as Kim Sung-jin, a researcher from the Ministry of Defense. After saying this, he reflects that he never thought that the time would come when he would be responsible to the state government, apparently his current project has attracted too much public attention. While Kim was thinking about this, the guards checked him for prohibited items and let him into the office with the words he's clean. Opening the door, Jean saw three people at the table, the first was the brain of the president, Professor Sor Han Sok Tae, the second was the deputy president, Captain Hai Yong Kyung, and finally the person who called this three-person meeting, the great cardinal, Minister Yoon Jong Yal. Seeing these people, Kim Sung did not believe that he would be able to meet such a figure. Since everyone who was supposed to be there was already there, the minister ordered to start, which caused Jun to come out of his thoughts and start saying that he would start with a briefing that the source was discovered on July by the Coast Guard in the closed area of Sokcho, after the investigation of the ship incident began, the guard was attacked. Before he could finish, the minister interrupted him and said that he heard Kim's son had video materials, so he should start with them. The excited researcher agrees and shows the video on the projector, saying that this is the first time that world history has ever seen something like this, so Jun shows the recording of something that was not previously known. Watching the video, the observers in the room were shocked, and Kim meanwhile comments on the video that, simply put, the researchers decided to call the monster in the video zombies, and Jun and his colleagues also took into account the name of the ship on which it all began. 82-02 so the name of this project is fully Zombie Apocalypse 82-02. Three months earlier. In one of the eateries, a waitress was taking customer orders. The TV screen was showing news that a very strong explosion had occurred in a city on the border with Russia, and the neighboring areas were on fire, but no one paid any attention to this information. Especially the mafia, who were drinking at one of the tables, one of the mafiosi said that he was leaving but would be back soon. To which another smilingly asked why his colleagues were joining the army. He argues that if the boys had done their assignments while they were at school, they would not have ended up like this, and then asks Kong Mingu to confirm his words. The men apologize for this, causing a lot of noise that disturbs other customers. One of them asks with an irritated look why these bastards are proud to be gangsters? Maybe we should remind them where they belong? Nah, it's his friend who says to just ignore them, Jinu is going to the army tomorrow. Hearing this, another friend at the table adds to his predecessor's words that if they make a fuss, Ji could get in trouble. These words make Nu panic, as he is afraid that he won't be able to go to the army. Trying to calm down, the first guy says that they can't let that happen. Meanwhile, the young man with the care was adding fuel to the fire for his friend, saying that he had heard that the army can feed you shit while cleaning toilets, and if this happens to Ji, he should just pretend to eat, but he doesn't have to. At this news, Nu falls into a stupor and angrily tells his friend not to say such things while eating. But the young man with the care changes the subject to Pink Punch, and all three of them turn to the TV screen where the girl duo was performing. Looking at the screen with tears in her eyes, Ji says that she is going to serve in order to protect Tara. Meanwhile, the guy with the brown hair was eating out of both cheeks, and the other two were arguing over who was better, Jenny or Tara. Suddenly, to end the argument, one of them asks Sam Sick who he likes better. He replies with a smile on his face that he likes them both, it's obvious. This causes his friends to be displeased. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by noise. At the next table, a waitress was bowing to one of the gangsters for staining Kang Min's suit, saying that she would reimburse the dry cleaning costs. The thug says that this is not enough and that she must also compensate for moral damages. The waitress asks what she should do. Licking his lips perversely, the thug grabs the girl's hand and orders her to sit with him, but before he can take the waitress away, the same guy from the next table grabs his hand, warning him that it's enough to make noise because there are people around. To which the thug simply slaps the young man and asks him what exactly is enough, you bastard? 
He tells him not to think that he has become a movie character, because this is a cruel reality. After these words, the gangster's stomach was hit with a powerful punch that sent the bastard to sleep, right next to Kong Min's leg. Seeing this, the other mafiosi sitting at the table jumped up, and behind the young man himself was an irritated man who was one and a half times bigger than the one who was lying on the ground and asked the boy if he understood what he had done. Turning around, the young man replied that he did not care. This irritates the gang even more. Watching this action, Sam Sik asks his friends if his friend needs help with this. The guy in glasses replies that he is the sheriff, although it will not be easy to deal with the gangsters alone. Their sudden fight is interrupted by Gu, who says that it is low to threaten a child, but that an eye for an eye should be paid. With that, the man takes off his jacket and approaches the boy. When he is close enough, Khan asks his opponent for his last words. The man says that he wants Gu to eat shit and kicks him right in the head. But the man simply dodges without a drop of emotion. After that, he grabs the young man by the collar and presses him to the ground with the intention of punching him in the face, but the guy is the first to attack, forcing Kong to dodge. The boy gets to his feet, and Gu takes the bottle. Standing in front of each other, they want to end it all with one punch, but at the last moment they stop at the sound of a patrol car. One of Mingu's colleagues turns to his boss and tells him that the cops are already here, so they need to leave. Turning around, the man says that he shouldn't let the skeet get in his way or he will die. Kong Min says that it's mutual, and he'll kill him himself the next time he sees him. The friends who were watching all this time asked if the sheriff was okay. The man with the broken nose gave a thumbs up to confirm that he was fine. Meanwhile, in the car. The mafioso asked if he should follow the guy from the restaurant. Kong, looking at his wound, says that he shouldn't, and that if they ever have to meet again, it will happen. Nonsense Training Center. The friends stood hugging each other and saw Ji off. Sik himself was teasing his friend and telling him not to look for them. This irritated Noon. Seeing this, Sam turned it into a joke and said that they would all go to the ocean together during Ji's vacation. This proposal was supported by the others. The comrades promised to do so, but they never had a chance to fulfill this promise. Three months later, the ocean border at Sokcho, a few days before Jim's vacation. The Korean water police gave the first warning to an unknown ship that was invading a closed area, asking to speak to the captain, the officer gave the second warning, but heard no response. At that time, the world itself turned into hell. Young asked what they should do and whether they should take an unknown ship hostage. The captain replied that they should follow the instructions and start with a search. He threw hooks on the neighboring vessel. The search team boarded the ship and began searching, but there was nothing inside the vessel. After hearing an order from the command, one of the search team took off his helmet and, noticing something strange, went to search the hold. Illuminating the darkness with a flashlight, Sergeant Kim saw the unimaginable, a living zombie. Hearing his colleague's screams, he started running to help him. Not realizing what was happening, the comrades began to pull the sergeant out, and when they got him, they saw a zombie eating Kim's face. One of them ordered everyone to stand back and waved his assault rifle at the monster. After laying the victim down, his colleagues began to ask how he was doing. At that time, the search party reported that they were attacked by an unknown monster-like creature and they were going to shoot it. While the guys were reporting, the zombie stood still for a couple of seconds and then rushed at the nearest soldier in front of him, pouncing on him. The latter, in turn, was able to put his assault rifle in the way of the creature's teeth, restraining the attack. A bullet flew into the creature's head, shocking the soldier and causing the zombie to fall on the deck. Equally frightened, the shooter wondered if his comrade was okay. After hearing the shot, the command asked what happened. The officers replied that they would report back when they returned. But looking at the corpse, the squad did not even know how to explain what had happened. One of the soldiers asked how Kim was feeling. The soldier who was supporting his commander's body replied that the captain had a large laceration on his face. Upon hearing this, the officer ordered him to go back and report the need for medical attention. Turning back to ask the sergeant to hold on a little longer, the soldier saw the captain already out of it. Kim attacked his colleagues, burying them. That was the entirety of the CCTV footage. After finishing watching the video, Song Jin began to say that the ship was not registered, so it was unknown to which country it belonged, the damage was too serious, so researchers assumed that the ship had drifted away from the shore. After hearing this, the minister wondered how the man was still alive with no body part? Kim confirmed the information that it was a human being based on the forensic examination, which found that all organs and genetic materials were located correctly, only the amount of hemoglobin in the blood was too low, 0.3 units, with a normal human range of 13 to 17. Waving his hand, the vice president asked Kim to be shorter. 
Nervously, Jean said that in short, based on the research, the sample does not need oxygen, which means only one thing. It does not need lungs and heart to continue living. The minister was puzzled by this information. Meanwhile, the professor wondered if it was possible to take the sample's insides to find out the reason. The professor suggested that it was better to start small, conducting small experiments, the only way this creature could enjoy their hospitality to the fullest. After listening to all the information, Yun Zhang concludes that their country is lucky this year, but the damage is too great, so are the researchers ready to stop the project? Or can the project be implemented with minimal risk? Looking at Yeol with a sideways glance, Kim replies that the minister is right, there are many things to be sorted out before a full-scale trial can begin, and one of those things is infection. Hearing this, Sukte asks Song Jin what the prognosis is with this research. He replies that there are no exact predictions, but that the transformation of cells probably occurs after the saliva of the infected person enters the human bloodstream. After hearing this, the professor explains that infection occurs only if the victim's flesh is bitten deep enough, so it looks like this infection is weaker than AIDS in terms of spread, but what happens if it's the other way around? Hearing this, the captain turns his gaze to Han Suk with fear and surprise. The latter, in turn, continues to ask the researcher questions about what will happen if a person eats the flesh of this monster? If Jin's subordinates have not forgotten the risks, then Kim and his colleagues simply have to investigate this process. The minister stops the procession, calming the professor down and asking if Jean has the samples, how long the experiment will take, and if they will get the results this week. Dr. Kim thought he was going to go crazy from such pressure, but he could not say no. Then, looking at his watch, Jean said that it was time to see everything with his own eyes and asked to turn around. Behind the minister, a wall began to open, revealing the trio of the same poor people from the ship. Feeling flesh, the zombies immediately ran at their victims, but there was a barrier in their way. Approaching the glass, the doctor demonstratively tapped on it, explaining that it was acrylic glass 15 centimeters thick, the oxygen level in the area behind it was below 10%, which was several times less than in Seoul, and the specimens behind the glass could move without oxygen and did not feel pain. Watching this, the minister concludes that the soil has everything it needs to survive, but it lacks intelligence, the ability to think is the most important quality of a soldier. After that, Yoon Jong asks if these monsters can shoot a gun. Kim answers that they probably can't. Hearing this, Yeol begins to say that he still thinks that zombies don't lose value because they don't know how to use weapons, and asks if Jean has already been involved in simulating military operations. To this, the doctor says that his team has roughly calculated the consequences of introducing these creatures into a modern city where no one has heard of them. First, 2% of the population of 100,000 people will be infected on the first day, 17% on the second day, and 34 on the third. Han Suk decides to add to this information, saying that on the third day, measures will be taken to deal with the growing number of infected people, and the priority will be to ban the spread of information, but what will happen to the megacities in this case? To this, Jean says that he will try to calculate such a situation under the same conditions, 47% on the first day, 64% on the second, and 70% on the third. There are two reasons for such a rapid increase in the number of infected compared to a small town. First, in small towns, the population density is much lower, and second, these creatures can walk about 20 kilometers a day. After listening to all the information, the captain asks what the boss thinks, knowing all this data, does Yun Zhang think this investment is worthwhile? Based on the fact that losing more than 50% of the population before the war starts is a very serious loss, and they will be too busy exterminating these creatures afterwards. There will be no time or resources left for military action, and such weapons can be much more dangerous than nuclear weapons, but it all depends on how they are used. Looking at the glass, Yeol asks what weaknesses the monsters have. Kim replies that zombies do not show any reaction to external stimuli, there is also no point in wounding them, as it is necessary to damage their brains in order to make them stop, and if we talk about the effect of temperature, the creatures stop moving after the 55 degree mark. This news surprises the minister, as the man clarifies that if the monsters stop at minus 55 but move again when warm, it means that they can be controlled in this way. Jean tries to correct Yoon Jong, but he interrupts and gives them two years and says that he will fund them as long as they need, only on the condition that they invent a vaccine that will reverse the mutations in those two years. Dr. Kim sat in the van leaving the briefing and wondered if he had done the right thing, as soon as they invent a vaccine the government plans to release these creatures all over the world, not to mention how much such a vaccine would cost, 
but also not to worry that such opportunities do not come easily. While Jean was thinking about this, the truck ran into spikes spread on the road by someone, causing the tire to burst and the van to skid to the side. Kong got out of one of the cars that was chasing the truck, smoking a cigarette, saying that the rain was getting heavier and ordered his men to deal with the matter as quickly as possible. At that moment, the van was seized by the Manbi group, led by third-ranking Kong Min. Ji was sitting in his station and writing a letter to his friends saying that he was fine, he didn't even think that they would leave like that, so he doesn't know if they are okay, Ji thinks that Yubin is going through a hard time, because of the hot-tempered sheriff and the womanizer Sam sick, the young man is very interested in how they are doing and by the way he was promoted to a sniper of a special category. Yesterday the young man made 20 shots clearly on target at a distance of 2. 150 meters right in front of the commander, but even if I tell you you will not understand how impressive this is, so the details will be left for the trip to the ocean, so that's it. Folding up the letter, a satisfied G looked at the rain outside the window. Meanwhile, Dr. Kim couldn't understand what was happening, so his fellow traveler decided to see what happened to the wheel and got out of the van. Shining a flashlight, the man sees a grid for stopping cars, quickly realizing the situation, the driver tries to report, but is stopped by a blow to the head with a bat, which makes him fall to the ground in front of the gang. Khan orders an attack on the truck and its escort. The gangsters begin to smash the cars and start a fight to the death in the middle of the road. Looking at this situation, one man from the convoy orders to call for reinforcements and prepare for a shootout, when suddenly a knife flies into the head of the guy who was supposed to carry out the order and Ming Gu appears on the side of the convoy commander, throwing his arm out to attack. With a precise punch to the jaw, Kong sends the man to rest, and the guards open fire on him, but the gangster rolls over the hood of the car and takes one of the henchmen as a shield and goes straight to the government officials, who looked at Kong saying that he was crazy. Seeing all this action with a smile on his lips, one of the Hyunams admired the fearless Mingu. Hearing this, the guard from the front seat asked if the captain really needed to participate in this personally. Lighting a cigarette, the man replied that the secretary of the company's chairman, Taeyong, had visited him yesterday and asked him to protect what was inside the truck at all costs. The guard tensed up, thinking that Chairman Huang is the leader of Taeyong, a major figure in the business world of South Korea and the man whose support has helped Man Bay expand around the world, and that if it were not for Taeyong's sponsorship, Man Bay would not exist today, and Chairman Huang had given this order. With this in mind, the guard asks his passenger what is in that van. But the man replies with a cheerful smile that he doesn't care, they just do what they're told and get paid for it. This makes the driver think even more, because the emperor of the business world has entrusted a man who works at night to get something, which is quite interesting. Meanwhile, Kong and his team have already finished with everyone, and Mingu decides to see what's in the truck. Standing in front of the door to the van, the two mafiosi concluded that this truck was clearly not ordinary and if they had known that a password would be required, they would have left one of those guys alive. While they were deciding what to do with the cargo, another man approached their company holding Dr. Kim by the collar, who had been caught trying to escape. Trying to beg for mercy, Jean falls to his knees. The gangsters surround him and start asking questions, and one of them takes something from Kim Sung's pocket and says to the boss that they have to make this guy open his mouth because he is from the Defense Research Institute. Holding Kim's badge, Kong leans over to the doctor and points to the van and asks him what the password is. The doctor replies that he doesn't know because it's classified information, and it's only available to agents. Smiling, Mingu clarifies by repeating the words of his hostage, and then waving a knife, cuts his cheek, saying that he will ask again. Kim begged for mercy, but Kong didn't care. Putting the knife to Jin's face, Mingu asks again if the doctor really doesn't know the password. Kim Sung tries to warn him that the door should not be opened, only to be stabbed again on the other cheek. Holding the wounds on his face, covered in blood, with a trembling voice, the man tries again to warn the man in front of him not to be interested in what is inside, as it is very dangerous. Looking at his victim, Kong says that the doctor should take better care of his own life, not the lives of others, so he shouldn't even think that Mingu will let him die quickly and painlessly. Kim's eyes reflected his hunter, who was just standing over him and waiting. Unable to withstand such pressure, Jean finally gave up and said the password. One of the gangsters went to check it immediately, and after entering the password, the door opened. Suddenly, someone's voice came from behind Mingu, asking why he was doing nothing. Is he waiting for someone? One of the mafiosi tries to justify himself, but Kong stops him. The voice belonged to the second brother, who was passing by Gu to the truck and saying that they should try together, since Mingu can't do anything without him. 
Looking at this situation, the gangsters whispered about what a bastard this second brother was, hiding until everything was clear, and only came out of the shadows at that moment. Meanwhile, the mobster himself had already opened the door, looking at what was inside, and remembering Hyanam's words, he wondered what the hell was going on if agents of the National Intelligence Service were assigned to guard this truck? If Chairman Huang himself was interested, then this was definitely something amazing, and they had to find out what was going on here, only then would they have no regrets. The second brother who entered the truck did not understand why it was so cold there, and with a flashlight, the man opens one of the cells and sees a frozen soldier. This confuses the mafia, he opens the other containers to see if there are corpses in them too, wondering why the government assholes are so careful with the dead, but more importantly why Chairman Huang needed these bodies, since he would definitely not be interested in ordinary corpses. With that thought in mind, the thug opened the cell and looked at the corpse, saying that this one had a face like a sieve, probably injured by some animal, even his mother would not be able to recognize him. While the man was examining the corpses, one of the henchmen warned Hyanam that it was time to leave, but he simply barked at them to wait, as they would be finished if it turned out that they had taken the wrong thing, and was about to continue examining when he suddenly heard a noise behind him. Turning around, thinking it was the jerks from the group, the second brother saw a corpse come to life, and only now did the man realize that they were far from corpses. Meanwhile, the monster was still recovering from his sleep. Standing in front of the soil, the big man thought that this was some kind of advanced cryogenic technology. While he was thinking about it, the zombie was already running right at him. Having successfully dodged the attack, Choi was puzzled by this turn of events and did not care that someone in front of him hit the monster right in the head because it was coming towards him. The zombie fell to the floor from this blow. The blood of his enemy was flowing victoriously from the man's hand. Breathing heavily, the second of the man Bay proudly said that he was Choi Song Ho, but it was not over yet. The man's leg was already being bitten by another zombie, and when Sung Ho saw this, he tried to drive the creature away from his leg, but he didn't have time and ended up in ticks. Meanwhile, Kong was just standing outside, deciding to smoke. One of the wards asks Mingu if he shouldn't check what's going on in the truck. Then he offers him his cigarette lighter. Kong replies that he just needs to get out of the way so that he doesn't get into unnecessary conflicts. Suddenly, the gangster hears a noise behind him coming from the van. Turning around, Mingu sees the other mobsters trying to shout out to Hyunnim, but to no avail, so the gangsters decide to open the door and see their leader being eaten by zombies. Quickly realizing everything, one of the mafiosi decides to help and kicks one of the scum. Then he takes out a knife and stabs the other one. Turning around, the man turns to other observers to help, but they just stood there and watched as their comrade was attacked from behind by a zombie biting right into his neck. The thug could not understand what was happening, he was sure that he had mortally wounded this monster, while the man was thinking about it, his transformation into a zombie was already complete. Meanwhile, the zombie was biting his victim harder and harder in front of the other mafia men, who were just watching in shock. Having finished with the first one, the monsters went to the others. The mafiosi decided to take up arms at the sight of this, and Kong stood there thinking that Choi Songho was a loser, but he wasn't easy to hurt, so who were they? Although in any case, whoever these bastards were, they stood in Manbei's way, so they're going to die for it. While Mingu was thinking, the zombies were already spreading more and more. Looking at this, the living mafia couldn't understand what was happening, were they really cannibals, and what should they do in such a situation? Khan punched his ward on the shoulder and ordered them to move, and he himself went to one of the scum who was enjoying the flesh at that moment. Coming closer, the gangster strikes at the monster, and then is surprised to see that the creature's throat is already slit. This disrespect infuriates Mingu, as the man cuts off the head completely from the body, which in turn simply falls on the wet road. Kong thinks that he's done with one of the mafia men, when suddenly the voice of one of the mafia men warns Hyunnim of danger. Turning around, Mingu sees two more monsters attacking him. Having successfully dodged them, Kong ponders the fact that these creatures continue to resist even after being stabbed several dozen times, who are they and why don't they die? With these thoughts in mind, Kong slams the zombies to the ground, saying that these guys really know how to be annoying. But he notices another one on his side, holding his face, a smile appears on the man's lips and he realizes that even blades don't take these scum and this will be really interesting. Suddenly, Mingu wonders how the first one died. He remembers that he cut off his head, and the man realizes that the head is the weak point. Kong immediately lunges at his opponent, piercing his throat, as if he suddenly sensed the danger, but quickly dodges it, thinking that if he had taken out a knife a little later, he would have been dead. 
Then he pushes off the road and kicks the zombie in the legs with a U-turn, causing the monster to fall to the ground. This leads Mingu to another conclusion, that monster's bones do break, too. The zombie tries to get up, but Kong sends it back to the ground with a kick to the head, but even so, the monster remains alive. Finally, the enemy was dead, Mingu looked at the sky washed by the rain and said that he finally realized that they need to open the skull to kill. Kong sat opposite the zombie he had killed and smiled, taking the knife in his hand, a new enemy had already appeared on his side, not giving him a break. Having successfully dodged, the man counterstrikes the zombie's leg, knocking it down. Holding the pipe and standing directly above the monster, Mingu salutes the man's loyalty, as the others are already lying dead, but this one is not afraid. While Kong was speaking, the zombie had already risen and stood in front of the man, who immediately struck a blow, breaking the creature's leg, causing the former soldier to fall to the ground again and start screaming. This time, Mingu did not wait, immediately launching a second attack towards the monster. After that, stepping on the head of the immobilized zombie, he said that the monster should have thought about who to be loyal to. But the zombie was still trying to get up. This surprised Kong and made him think that this little bastard didn't really care about the broken neck. His will to live is impressive, but it's time to end it. With this thought in mind, Ming swings his sword with the intention of stabbing the head of the creature under his foot when someone stops him. The headlights blind the man. Hyung Nim gets out of the car and says that he understands that Kong is an energetic kid, but he shouldn't beat them up to that extent, because they won't get paid. Kong is not pleased, looking back at the battlefield and saying that he feels like he's in a horror show. When the man in the car says that Min shouldn't be a child, you'd think they hit him once. The words made Min's hand with the pipe tense. Hyung Nim was clearly not happy that Kong was trying to disobey the order. But Gu himself had said that the man should deal with it himself, and he was taking his men. As Min walked away, he could only hear the disgruntled screams behind him. Sitting in the car, Hyung Nim smiled at the strength of this arrogant brat in front of him, but first they had to deal with this zombie, Chairman Huang was looking forward to it. The monster was lying in the box trying to break free. Looking at it, the packer could not understand whether it was a human or a rabid dog, if not for the head, this monster would be dead, but this bastard still does not understand anything. After these words, the mafioso closes the trunk of the car. Meanwhile, Hyung Nim was sitting there wiping his ring and asking what happened to Choi. He was told that Sung Ho was still unconscious, possibly due to blood loss. Hearing this, the boss ordered Choi to be sent to the hospital. One of his subordinates appears outside the car window and informs him that the goods are already packed. In response to this information, the man says that he will first clean up the place and then return. After these words, the cars drove away. Meanwhile, one of the mafiosi addressed Kong, saying that he was disappointed in Hyunim, because his people, his team, are our colleagues, but they just watch the deaths, this bastard only cares about money. Mingu tells him not to think about it, just to clean up, to put the bodies of the group's people in the cars and the garbage in the truck, and pay for everything. The young man, who had been dumbfounded by these words, confirmed that he understood the order when he suddenly felt Kang's hand on his shoulder. At that moment, the man said that when they were done here, they should have a drink, as they had to honor the memory of the dead. These words restored hope to the boy. Their conversation was interrupted by a voice shouting that there was a survivor. Day 6 stood in front of them. Looking at him, Mingu wondered why this mafioso was moving like that, it was unnerving, really. While Kong was thinking, the guy next to him was already hugging his friend, saying that the guy thought his friend was already dead and he needed to take him to the hospital. Seeing this, Gu started shouting for him to get away from the Sika right away, but it was too late, the zombie sank his teeth into the neck of his ward, capturing the emotion of fear on the guy's face. The other mafiosi were shocked by the situation. While Kong was ordering everyone to disperse, he kicked the monster from his knee right in the head, freeing the guy, but the zombie didn't even think to stop. Looking at this, Ming realized that they had turned into one of those monsters, was it really contagious? Kong was brought out of his thoughts by the screams of his wards, who were shouting that those who were dead had begun to come back to life. All those who had fallen in the battle had risen from the dead. Seeing this picture, Gu still could not understand who they were. Meanwhile, the vermin were already running for fresh flesh. The mafia asked what they should do. They received a clear order from Ming to get in the cars and get out of here as fast as possible. In a panic, Gu did not understand where to go, but one of the gangsters called him to his car and got in. Kong just watched the picture of his ward being eaten by zombies, the guy's face was only an expression of agony. But Ming could do nothing about it, so he simply gave the order to drive. The car started moving, meeting the expected obstacle of monsters on its way, 
knocking them down as the car tried to drive on. The driver pressed harder and harder on the gas to throw the zombie off the hood, but it in turn broke through the windshield to get to the fresh meat. Kong, who was sitting in the back seat at the time, panicked and ordered the car to go faster. So the car moved even faster, pushing the speedometer to its maximum, but due to poor visibility, the driver still lost control and the car went into a spin. The zombie is still grabbed by the mafia, while Khan shouts to his ward to turn the car around because there was a building in front, but it was too late. The car crashed into the building with a bang and started to burn. Coming to his senses, Ming saw his driver and a downed zombie in front of the car, the man's arm was broken. Not in his best condition, Gu ironically says that it's time to fight, but unexpectedly he can't find his knife, and then helplessly looking up at the sky, he remembers the same mud in whose throat his cleaver was left and concludes that it will be a long night. The Gansu Treatment Plant The alarm sounded throughout the building, and it was already 3.30 in the morning. The girl got out of bed and couldn't understand what was happening at such a late hour, did something happen to the purification system, it was a pain in the ass for Lim Su Chion. Going downstairs, she saw her colleague and asked him what had happened to the cleaning system since the alarm was going off? The sleepy guy replied that it wasn't quite so, the problem was near the fence. He pointed to the smoke behind the fence and said that someone's car had driven into it. Looking at the smoke, Lim asked if it was something serious. Her colleague replied that they were finding out. Suddenly, Zhang noticed a person trying to climb the fence. The employees told Ken that the passage was forbidden and they would call the police. The guy who was standing next to the girl watching this said that it was obviously another drunk driver, if someone is going to drink, he should at least behave properly, that's why the guy thinks that drunk people are like dirty animals. Meanwhile, Ken still managed to climb over the fence, falling to the ground exhausted. At this point, Lim excused herself and said that since the cleaning system was fine, she would leave. The guy told her not to worry and to go to bed. But before Su Chi could do so, her attention and the guy's attention were drawn to Ming Gu, who put the guards to sleep with two punches and began to raise their weapons. Seeing this, the guy couldn't understand how this happened. Was the man really not drunk? Meanwhile, Kong was approaching the entrance, and the guy started shouting that the man shouldn't come near, otherwise he would open fire. But Ming didn't listen to him, he was irritated and said that since the man in front of him wanted to be shot, he shouldn't blame him later. Before he could even finish, Gu knocked the young man out. The girl who was still watching, seeing the intruder's face, decides to run to the entrance as fast as she can. Lim tries to close the door, but Kong has already blocked it, but he still felt the pain from his broken arm. Ming began to ask the girl to stop or she would regret it. After that, Kong sat down in front of the door and said that at this rate they would both die, but honestly, dying in this situation would be better, if these bastards get here it will be worse than death, so if she opens the door he will not hurt her, and even protect her from the scum who are running here. Hearing this, Su Chi replied that she was not sure she could trust someone who had broken into private property and disabled three guards. Rising to his feet, Kong said that it didn't matter whether she believed him or not, because she had no choice but to let him in. Zombies began to climb over the fence, approaching the door, which was already barricaded. Lim asked who these monsters were. Kong, bandaging his arm, replied that he didn't know, but they were cute. A little annoyed, the girl said that this was no time for jokes, but the fact that Kong really didn't know who these monsters were didn't change. Fixing his arm, Ming said that he met them for the first time today, and then asked for help with the bandaging. Helping the man, Lim clarifies that he must know something. To which Gu says that he does know something, these creatures do not give up, even if they find a way to escape, no matter how long it takes. With that, Kong walks over to the kitchen knives and takes one of them. Meanwhile, Su Chong is nervously biting her nail, and then decides to go to the office to the guards to call the police. Min says that he doesn't think that's a good idea. This makes her angry, and she asks if the idea is not good because the man in front of her is a criminal. As Kong approaches her, he replies that people turn into such creatures after being bitten, and if she calls the police, their number will only increase, but if she wants to take responsibility, she can. Lim points out that it is possible to just clarify beforehand. This makes Gu laugh because he quotes their situation about monsters breaking out of the freezer and turning people into their own kind, and asks if anyone would believe that. This makes her even more angry, and she wonders what Kong will suggest instead of spouting depressing shit. Suddenly, their conversation is interrupted by a cracking sound. Su Chong, frightened by the sound, says that she hopes it wasn't the front door. Kong replies that the door is made of reinforced glass, so if it was, there would be metal scraping first and then the sound of broken glass, so there is no reinforced glass somewhere on the floor. 
Lim confirms the information, saying that it seems the windows in the back are just glass. Picking up the weapon, Kong concludes that the zombies are there, and then hands the baton to the girl, saying that it will be more useful than a knife for someone like her. Lim froze for a few seconds at this suggestion. She is brought out of her stupor by Min's clarification that he is not sending her out to fight just to be safe, but to buy herself some time if she encounters a monster. To help Su Chang understand, Gu shows her how to use the baton, first putting her left leg forward, bending it at the knee, and then swinging. The irritated and shocked Lim shouts out that she is clearly incapable of doing so. Holding out the baton, Kong says that it's up to her, but for now she should just stay here. The girl is not satisfied with this idea. Min agrees with Su's plan, telling her to just stay close to him, as Lim herself wouldn't do it even if he was a pig. Noticing that Kong has difficulty walking, Su Chang suggested using the elevator, but the man refused, saying that it was dangerous because the elevator could open right in front of. Kong was not allowed to finish because the zombie screams caused Gu to turn around and say that from now on, let Lim not make a sound. Climbing the stairs, the mafioso thinks that it has become too quiet, but the sensor is blinking, so there is something there. Pulling out a knife, the man looks closely at what is happening. Suddenly, a zombie jumps out at him out of nowhere. Kong manages to move away from the attack because the zombie flies past, crashing right into the wall. Seizing the moment, Gu stabs the monster in the neck and cuts it. Lim, who has been watching in shock, asks if the monster is dead. But Kong, pulling out a cigarette, just told her to go back to the kitchen because she would disturb him if she stayed. The screams of zombies came from upstairs, and a few seconds later more creatures appeared on the stairs. Smiling, Khan ironically asked the bastards to let him enjoy a cigarette. The zombies jumped down the stairs right at the man, who couldn't fight in such a place with a broken arm, he had to go to a better place to fight. Meanwhile, one of the monsters was already trying to bite Kong, dodging Gu pierced the monster's head, but the wound was not very deep, because of which the creatures standing on their feet decided to attack again. Quickly realizing the situation, Min cuts one of the creature's legs, causing it to fall, but the gangster grabs it by the collar and presses it against the wall. At this point, the second zombie was already attacking Kong from the side, but the mafia man simply repelled the monster's attack with his foot, pushing him down the stairs. The monster in his hand wanted to break free more and more. Fixing the monster's head with his hand, Ming dropped the knife from his mouth into his hand and cut off the zombie's head with one precise stroke. While Gu was dealing with one, the other was already heading straight for Lim, and when Kong saw it, he shouted for the girl to kick the monster's legs. The monster was running faster and faster, remembering Mina's lesson, Su Chan put her foot forward and with all her might hit the enemy in front of her on the knee, he in turn began to fall right on her, knocking Lim down and was about to bite, but was stopped by Kang's knife which cut right into his head. Looking at his partner, who was lying unconscious at the time, Ming said that he had kept his promise and still protected the girl, but it was not over. Returning to the kitchen, Gu put Lim down and sat down to rest himself, but screams from the corridor did not allow him to catch his breath. When Kong got up, he said that if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be interesting. Then he thought that if he turned this place into a freezer, even these monsters would have a hard time. After disconnecting some wires and covering Lim, who was still unconscious, Kong asked her to hold out until morning, when her colleagues would come. Meanwhile, the zombies had already kicked in the door to the kitchen, and the gangster turned around and saw the familiar face of Chilsung. Looking at the pack, Min took a knife in his teeth with the promise that he would put Chil out of his misery. Holding the food cart, the mafia man began to push it directly at the monsters in front of him, but only two of them were knocked down, the third one was already attacking the man. But Khan himself simply slit the throat of his former ward, causing him to fall in his death cries. The two monsters also did not wait and attacked Min. Gu deftly cut off the first one's arm, then changed the position of the knife in his hand and slit the poor guy's throat. The last zombie wanted to bite Gu from behind, but Kong reacted quickly and stabbed the knife right into the monster's ear. It was another victory of man over the creatures. The blood of the former humans was spreading on the floor, and Kong smoked a cigarette and stuck it into the mouth of his dead ward Chiel with words of farewell. Heading to the hall, Kong thought about Dr. Kim and reflected on the fact that he could not have imagined that the crybaby would be so right, even Choi Songho must have turned, not knowing what was going on was very depressing, if only the man's phone hadn't broken. Going outside, Kong saw three figures, it was the police, it would certainly be a big risk, but Kong still decides to get the information. After that, he throws away the knife and calls the patrolman to him, but they were no longer people, but rather living corpses that were now running straight for Gu. The mafioso just stood there not realizing how many more of them there would be. Night turn today.
The sheriff asks Yubin how he feels about stewed meat and rice for lunch. He replies that his friend is really obsessed with this dish. The young man next to him confirms this. Their conversation is interrupted by Samshik showing them a letter from Ji. Shocked by the news, the boys run to find out what it says. While reading the letter, the friends cheerfully discussed what was written. Sik asks what best shot means. Yubin replies that Ji is simply the best sniper. As he pulls the bags, Sik confirms that Noon always had good aim when they played games. Smiling, the sheriff denies this, saying that Noon was probably just lucky, and then notices the new guy at work walking around again, and as he approaches him, he asks what he's doing. What scares the young man, smiling the sheriff takes the young man's phone and asks him if he is looking at something perverse. The newcomer immediately begins to deny it and asks for his phone back. Hearing that there was something perverse on the phone, Sik immediately wanted to see what it was. Yubin tried to warn them, but he decided to take a look anyway. Standing in a circle, the friends turned on the recording and saw a horde of zombies instead of perversions. The video showed devastation, people running away from the monsters and becoming them after being bitten one by one. The boys just stood there watching. Sik couldn't understand why people were eating other people. The sheriff turns to the newcomer and asks if this is footage from a movie. He replies that the video was shot this morning at the Knox Sapien station and quickly spread on the internet. However, none of his friends have seen it until now, and looking at them, the guy says that they are a group of boomers, obviously they haven't seen anything. These words infuriate the sheriff, but he is calmed down in time by Yubin. Meanwhile, the guy's phone loses its network signal. Bin kept on calming his angry friend, and Sik noticed that even though lunch was over, no one was still there. Now the other boys are wondering where everyone is. Yu tries to call, but can't find his phone, so Sheriff decides to call from his, but Sam stops him saying that he doesn't have a phone either, because their phones are in the truck that went to lunch, and then suggests that they just work and then go out and have fun. The Sheriff is completely fine with this idea, but Bean insists that they need to wait for the others. Suddenly, helicopters fly overhead. Looking at them, the group wonders what so many helicopters are doing here. But Sick only cares when the food arrives. Meanwhile, the virus was spreading more and more, filling the streets with blood and victims, including construction workers. After a while, Sam looked through the spyglass and kept repeating how hungry he was. Seeing Sick looking through the optics, the sheriff asks where he got that shit. You replies that he seems to have won it about two days ago at the slot machines, and must have spent at least ten bucks to win something. The sheriff wonders if Sick can even see anything through this spyglass. He says that he can see a wrench lying on the ground, and he can see all the way to the wall, but he can't see anything beyond it. The sheriff says that of course this thing won't help him see through walls. Proud of his thing, Sick says that it is still quite useful. To which his friends categorically deny this information. After getting water bottles, the newcomer complained about the heat. The sheriff asked him if his phone was working. But the young man denied it, not understanding why the hell they were building a retirement home in such a place. Bean replied that it was because their previous plan to build a new city hadn't worked. Suffering from the heat, the sheriff suggested that they stop talking and eat already, as they would be starving to death here until the others returned. Six supported this, but the newcomer said they didn't have a car. To which he says they can just walk. The newcomer says it will take about an hour to walk. Bin says that's only if you take the main road, if you take a shortcut, it will take 10 minutes. After hearing this, the guy decides to stay anyway and asks him to bring him something. The sheriff was about to get angry with him, but he noticed that Sik was putting on gloves and asked why he was doing that. Sam replies that they make it easier to jump over the railing, and he looks cool in them. And while showing the moonwalk, he sings that he wants cold noodles. Bin is angry that his friends are suffering from bullshit, and he tells them to leave. Having calmly climbed over the fence, Sik defiantly stood in a rack in front of a displeased Yuan sheriff, who had failed to climb over the fence. The helicopters reappeared in the sky, raising the wind above the boys. Seeing them, Sik offers to buy one and take it to visit Jean. Smiling, Bin teases his friend asking if he has that kind of money. The sheriff joins in the teasing, telling him to give him the car for his birthday. Suddenly the group hears music. The sheriff wonders if the party has always been this loud. Below them was an old man jogging. A radio was hanging around the old man's neck, playing loudly for the whole street. The friends decide to walk as fast as they can to avoid going deaf. They finally reach their destination, but an unexpected obstacle is in front of them. The sheriff says that it's not just another old man, this neighborhood is full of crazy people. Looking at the person in front of him, Bin says that it's strange because the man in front of them is wearing a suit, 
but businessmen are very rare in this area, and his wounds are quite deep and his whole body is covered in blood. Hearing this, Sick wonders what happened to the man. Is he really injured? Unexpectedly, the monster starts screaming. Trying to push the monster away, Sick accidentally allows the monster to bite him. His friends who were watching could not believe what was happening. Sick tried to break free from the zombie's jaws, asking it to stop. Shocked, Bean looked into the eyes of the stranger and concluded that he was out of his mind. The sheriff, meanwhile, saying that he did not start the fight, so it will be considered self-defense, swings his leg to kick and hits the monster right in the jaw, sending it to the ground. Ju was trembling in pain, then smiled and said it was okay, and they fell for it. This news relaxed Ju, and the sheriff restrained himself from hitting his friend. Looking at Sam adjusting his gloves with satisfaction, Bin praised the Lord that Sick had put on those stupid gloves after all. Their conversation was interrupted by a scream that immediately caught the boy's attention. The sheriff could not believe that the man had already recovered, and then asked Sam for the gloves. Looking at his friend putting on the gloves, Yu says that the man must have gone crazy. To which the sheriff says that he is not going to fight the man, the guy can do more than that. These words surprise the young man's friends. With a serious look on his face, the boy says that he will settle the matter peacefully. Then Bean asks why the sheriff is flexing his fists. The boy replies that he won't fight, but if the man attacks first. The zombie has already risen to his feet and started running towards the group, which scared Sick and Bin and surprised the sheriff. Striking a pose, the boy hit the monster in the stomach with a backhand and felt that he had broken a rib. The young man realized that he had miscalculated the force. But the zombie didn't care about that and attacked again. The sheriff couldn't understand how this was possible, he felt 100% that he had broken the man's ribs. The young man simply retreated to the fence. There was no way out, but he still had to dodge the attack. Realizing that the man is about to fall into the water, the sheriff tries to grab him, but in vain. The zombie is still splashing around. The friends just stood there looking at the broken fence, which is why Six said that the sheriff had just killed a man. Panicking, the young man replies that he didn't kill anyone, they saw the man fall into the water by himself. Bin tries to calm his friend down and says that everything should be fine, since it's not high up here and the water should soften the blow, they should go down and check on the stranger, even if he survived, it's not safe to leave him there. Suddenly, with an expression of panic, Sick points to the man, saying that he is still moving, who is he anyway? Meanwhile, the zombie started running, which made his friends happy that he was okay. But still, Sam could not understand where the man was running to because there was nothing in that direction. Stretching his neck, the sheriff replied that it didn't matter where he ran to, he had to go eat. At that moment, Bean was wondering how a person could keep running after his ribs were broken, and he tried to bite sick, it was nonsense, and by the way, the railing, the man just ran and knocked it down. His friends brought him out of his thoughts and asked him to hurry up. Catching up with his friends, you talked about what he was going to eat. Meanwhile, the city was turning into ruins, the zombies were getting bigger and bigger, they were spreading to all corners. But the friends didn't know about it yet, cheerfully discussing what they would eat. Juice, suffering from hunger, asked how far they had to go. To which the sheriff said that it was a little further. When they reached the exit, the friends heard strange sounds. Assuming it was a parade, Sam started to climb first. Deciding that they would find out everything only after they got up, the group left the passage. When Sick came out first, he just stopped, and his friends started teasing him that he must have seen some beauty. But after they stood up, the smiles on their faces instantly disappeared. The guys saw the apocalypse. Everything was exploding and falling apart, zombies were catching up with the survivors and enrolling them in their ranks, this was the picture that appeared before the friends. Unable to accept the fact, Sick tried to justify it by making a movie. To which the sheriff said that this was not a fucking movie. Suddenly, Bean covered his mouth with his hand, gesturing to the quiet and ordering him to leave, which surprised the sheriff. Turning to the crosswalk, Sher saw someone being eaten by a zombie and quickly descended. The guy ordered his friends to run from the horde that was right behind them. As they were running away, Sick asked if he was sure it wasn't a horror. Bin replied that there was no way it was a fucking horror, they were eating people, they were zombies, there was no other way to explain it. The screams of the zombies filled the passage. The friends were trying their best to get away from the mess behind them. At that moment, Sick was adding fuel to the fire, saying that they would be caught up soon. After getting out of the crosswalk, the guys led the zombies with them, and Sam suddenly suggested that they turn off the road. Turning to the fence and climbing it, Sick stretched out his hand to his puzzled friends. At that moment, the zombies were hurrying the boys. First, the sheriff began to help you climb over the fence. Meanwhile, the zombies were getting closer and closer, 
so the sheriff gathered all his strength and threw Ben over the fence. You fell to the ground with Sick and quickly turned around to see their friend jumping over the fence and landing neatly on the road. This surprises his friends, who say that they had forgotten that the sheriff is not a man, but some kind of gorilla. To which the guy says that they should watch their words. After that, the friends watched the monsters trying to get over the fence, but they couldn't because they were stupid zombies. Having calmed down a bit, the friends sat down to rest. Sam was glad that they didn't have to run, and the sheriff agreed. But you began to say that they were too early to rejoice, if the monsters knocked down this obstacle, the worst would come to them. At that moment, the monsters were trying their best to get through the fence. Sitting down, Sick realized something, so he asked his friends if they thought Mr. Huang and the others had been killed. Recalling the whole nightmare, Bin confirms his friend's guess. And Sheriff, shaking his head, suggests that they go back to the construction site and think about it later. But it was easier said than done. Zombies surrounded the fence from all sides. The guys just watched as they were besieged. Because of this, Sheriff suggests going to the subway and hiding there. But you denies this idea saying that probably all the rooms there are closed, if they go there and the doors are closed they will have nowhere to run, even if there is an open room, the three of them are not enough to check each one. Hearing this, Sick asks if the sheriff can't just turn off the zombies. He says that he can't turn off those who don't care about injuries. Then Bean suggests that the sheriff just kill them. These words shock his friends beyond words. But you continues to insist on killing them. Disturbed by his friend's behavior, the sheriff asks if he is serious. Bin defends himself by saying that it's not even murder, the freaks don't even look like people. The sheriff agrees but still hesitates. Meanwhile, Sick throws stones at the monsters, saying that he will protect them by throwing them at the zombies. Seeing this, the friends sarcastically agreed that it looked reliable. Looking at one of the monsters, the sheriff closed his eyes for a second to calm down and then said that he would probably be able to kill it, but he needed a weapon. Hearing this, Bean repeats what the sheriff said and asks where he can find a weapon. The guy says that he doesn't know, but he can't kill these monsters with his bare hands. You replies that there is hardly anything suitable here. Having said that, the sheriff decides to throw stones. At this time, Sick was standing there thinking that he had seen something similar somewhere, and suddenly enlightenment came to the young man. His shocked friends turn to him, and Sam smilingly tells them to just follow their young. These words confuse the boys, but they follow him anyway. When they get to the fence, Sick picks up the wrench, smiling with satisfaction, and hands it to the sheriff, who in turn asks how Sam knew there was a wrench there. The sheriff replies that they should remember the telescope through which he saw something lying on the ground. Recalling that moment, the boys realize they were wrong. Waving the key, the sheriff says that in any case, the only problem is where to start. Bean, who has looked around the territory, says that it is better to start with those three, since they are watching them non-stop, but they will surely bite if you try to climb over the fence. While the friends were discussing this, the fence began to shake, and they noticed a large pack of zombies pushing harder and harder against the barrier in front of them. Tensing up, the sheriff thought he had no choice but to climb over and kill them. Suddenly, a smiling sick raised his hand and said he had an idea. The young men got ready for it. And Sam smiled and said that he would be the bait. Did you like it and want to see the rest? Give us a like for a quicker release of your favorite story and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it on the day of release. Sick justified that he would be the bait by running fast. He would jump over the fence and make the zombies run after him. Then Bo would jump over the fence and help. Hearing this, the puzzled friends began to say that Sick was going crazy again, constantly risking his life. He had been like this since childhood and had remained so. After calming down, Sam says in all seriousness that this is the best they can do at the moment, he is the fastest of the three. At this, the sheriff grabs his friend by the collar and tells him to stop talking nonsense. No one cares that he is the fastest, let him not think that he can sacrifice himself and leave his dead body on them. Trying to reassure Ank Wang, Sick says that he will not die. Irritated, Bo angrily looks at Sam and tells him to stop sacrificing himself for others. To put himself first, they should always be together. Smiling, Sick took his friend's head, touched by the fact that he was being so concerned about him. Meanwhile, he was thinking that it was too dangerous to climb over the fence without a clear plan. There must be some other way to escape from the zombies without climbing over the fence, if they planned it well, it might work. With this thought in mind, Ben turns to his friends who are having fun at the moment and offers to unscrew half of the bolts. Starting to work, he orders to open the top first, then the zombies will fly ahead first. While the sheriff was unscrewing the nuts, Sam stood there urging him on, because the fence was not holding. He asked him to do something with his fingers if he wanted the work to go faster. 
Scared, Sick asked Bo to hurry up. He, in turn, waved the wrench and said that he knew what he was doing. Finally wiping off the sweat, the job was done. Putting on his gloves, he says it's time to hurry up. The guy will remove the fence, and his friends will deal with the zombies when they come. The boys froze in suspense. Bean jumped up on the fence, pushing on it with all his might. The fence gave way and began to tilt, letting the first monster through. The sheriff adjusted himself that he was not facing a human and then hit the zombie on the head with all his might, spreading it out on the ground. A look of irritation at his helplessness is replaced by shock that the zombie girl is not dead yet. Holding the fence to prevent other zombies from getting through, he hurried his friend to get on as soon as possible. Angry, Ankwank screams and finishes off the fence. Watching him, Six says that it was close, but it's good that Bo was able to handle it. But zombies die if their brains are damaged. Meanwhile, the sheriff was already running to Ben's aid, asking him to lower the fence and swinging the wrench. He hit one of the monsters right on the top of the head. The second one screaming nastily attacked his hunter. But the guy dodged the attack and hit this monster right in the head. Standing over the corpses and breathing nervously, Bo notices that one of the zombies is still moving. So he furiously hits the monster on the head, wishing it would finally die. His friends bring him out of his rage, and Anquan calms down. But that was not the end of it. The fence at the other end fell down, attracting the boy's attention, and a wave of zombies rushed right at them. The creatures rose up from the ground, heading straight for their prey. At that moment, Ben hurried his shocked friends to move faster. After climbing over, Yu and Sam hurried their friend who was already being overtaken by zombies. While Anquang was moving, his shirt got caught on something. That's why the sheriff started to free it. Thinking at that moment that everything was fine and he needed to calm down, but everything was far from fine. Spitting on his clothes, Bo finally gets out of the trap, but one of the zombies still grabs his leg. The sheriff watched as his leg was being squeezed tighter and tighter, causing him to panic. Panicking because the zombie was digging its nails into his leg, Bo tried to push the creature away from him. The guy's face was full of panic, and he was hitting the zombie's head. Finally, he let go of Anquan, but he did it so quickly that the sheriff lost his balance and rolled down. Looking at this, the friends approached the lying friend, wondering if he was okay. After that, they all decided to run away from the crowd that was behind them. While running away, the boys heard the music of the same jubilant man. As they ran, zombies were eating people. Suddenly, Sick noticed an old man on the radio being bitten by a zombie. The group wanted to help him, but hearing the unpleasant sound of a zombie chase behind them, he takes all the courage to shout that it's too late to save him. They need to run, or they will be bitten. The boys ran as fast as they could across the bridge. Turning around, Bean saw the city burning in flames. The monsters did not let anyone go, neither young nor old. They reached the building where the newcomer was still working. The boys got to the second floor. The sleepy young man did not understand why Bo was screaming so loudly. Meanwhile, Ankwang took a sledgehammer in his hands and hit the stairs with all his might. Checking the ladder, you says that it can protect the stairs, but it will be difficult to break them, so it might be better to find another place. The tired sheriff says that it's too dangerous, and they have a little time to spare so they need to break it down, but first the young man goes to get the tools. Still not understanding anything, the newcomer asks his friends what they are doing. Meanwhile, they were unscrewing the ladder leading to the second floor. The newcomer repeated the question again. Once again, Bo ignored him and swung a sledgehammer at the ladder, causing it to fall to the ground. The guy standing next to him grabbed his head in surprise. Not understanding why they damaged the ladder, he shouts that they are crazy bastards. The sheriff orders the newcomer to shut the fuck up. Bean, who was trying to rest, asked the young man to let them catch their breath first, then they would tell him everything. Juice, who was also exhausted, adds to his friend's point, saying that the newcomer will thank them later for saving his life. But the guy told them to stop talking nonsense and rebuild the ladder. Suddenly, the young man notices blood on their clothes, which leads him to assume that they broke the ladder so that the cops wouldn't find them. Yu tries to explain everything to the boy. While the sheriff was thinking about the fact that he had killed people, closing his eyes, Bo recalled all the events that happened today, from the first zombie in the apocalyptic world to his first murder. After hearing the whole story, the newcomer could not believe his friends. They, in turn, just sat there waiting for the guy to understand. Smiling, the young man says that it is incredible, but in a second his face changes to a tense one because the construction site was already teeming with monsters. Taking out their phones and turning on the news, 
the boys listen to the words of the presenter that today is 1318 and viewers can see on their screens the battlefield, violence and murder are taking place across the country, especially in Seoul. To overcome these difficult times, the Korean government has decided to call the armed forces and police to action. Please do not leave the house while the situation is still ongoing. The boys were prevented from watching the news by the dead phone battery. Bo asks if the newcomer doesn't have a charger. He says it's in his bag, and the bag is there, on the first floor. But they've already heard the news, they can't go outside until the army and police solve the problem, so they should just drink soju instead. Ben doesn't let the boy finish, saying that the police won't save them. The newcomer asks why the police won't come. He replies that the news about the zombies first appeared at 1330, and now it's 1830, five hours have passed, but zombies are still walking around. Hearing this, Bo adds to his friend's words, saying that this means that the armed forces and police have failed. Meanwhile, Sick realizes that the video they watched in the morning came out before the news, so more than 10 hours have passed. These words make him angry, and he tries to call the rescue service, but all he hears is that his call cannot be taken at the moment. Looking at the newcomer's panic, Anquan laughingly offers to disconnect the guy. Ben says that it's not necessary and asks how Bo's leg is doing, since it was injured by a zombie and needs to be treated anyway. After these words, you asks the newcomer to give him soju. But he just stood there looking at the guys in shock, and then starts screaming that they were bitten by a zombie. Bo replies that it wasn't a bite. Sighing calmly, the boy thought that he was worrying in vain, because if Ankawa had been bitten, he would not have behaved as usual. Meanwhile, Bo continued to smile and say that he was not bitten, he was just scratched. At this news, the boy jumps up and asks, isn't that the same thing? This behavior makes the sheriff angry, so he tells the newcomer not to talk shit, because Bo is not turning into a freak after all. The frightened guy says that it's not the bite, but the infection, so Ankawa needs to be thrown away, getting rid of him before he becomes a zombie. I didn't understand what the young man was talking about, but he insisted on his way. Taking Sheriff by the hand, the newcomer led him to the pit, saying that if he had any respect for his friends, he should jump in himself before he became a zombie. This situation had already begun to irritate Ankawa. Slapping the newcomer on the cheek, you ordered him to keep his temper, since Bo hadn't even become a zombie yet. Angrily, the newcomer begins to say that Ben is covering for him because they are friends, stupid jokers waiting for him to turn into a zombie, let's see if he will still be their friend when that happens. You can't take it anymore, grabbing the asshole by the collar. But their argument is stopped by the sheriff, who asks Sick to help him. He reluctantly started to come over. Suddenly, the radio started playing on the street. He could not understand why he was hearing music. Then he turned to the group that Ankawa was fighting, saying that Bo would be fine. The newcomer asked where he got that from, to which Sick tells them to come and listen for themselves. As they approached the pit, the guy saw a zombie with music playing, it was the same strange old man from the radio. After showing them this, Sam concludes that they saw the old man after the sheriff was scratched, they were running away from the fence, and then they saw the old man being bitten. Also realizing this, Bean confirms that Bon was scratched first, so if he was going to become a zombie, he would have become one before the old man, so now he is in the clear. The company's spirits rose at this news, but they were interrupted by a newcomer saying that they were so stupid. The virus is not that simple. Everything may be fine now, but then it is unknown. Grabbing the newcomer from behind, the sheriff began to mock him, saying that if he really turned, he would be the first to be bitten by it. Watching this, he notices that Sick is up to something and asks where he is going. Sam answers that he is looking for something. Then he goes up to the third floor and looks around and finds two bags. Bringing them to the others, the newcomer notices that they are the bags of the boss and Mr. Huang, and it is rather rude to touch the things of the dead. The sheriff responds to this chatter by saying that whatever Sick does, he will be more useful than the newcomer who is just wagging his tongue. After sorting through the bags on the floor, Sam finally found the pack of cigarettes he was looking for, and then noticed that Ben was doing something and asked what he was doing. He replied that he was looking for something. In a few seconds, Ben was holding a hammer drill that would become a weapon for them. At first, the friends did not understand their friend's words but he continued to say that he would turn it into a weapon. Morning came. The newcomer asked if he was really going to act on this plan. It was just crazy. But his friends were already preparing for the realization of this idea, checking the drum and the height. Seeing this, the guy notices that the idea of smashing zombie heads is certainly not bad, but they do it at random. He looks over at him, 
and says that he understands the guy's excitement, but that this is all they can do now. After that, he puts on his glasses, thinking about what he needs to try now and find out if this trap will work. With this in mind, the young man launches the trap, dropping it on the zombies, but it flies a centimeter above the monster's heads and hits the ceiling, and seeing this, Bean gives the command to lower the cord a little and launches the board again. Satisfied to see how the trap worked, the board hits one of the zombies right in the face, and seeing this, he orders him to get it out as soon as possible. The rope sprung up and lifted the board, where the boys saw the zombie attached. Ben started shouting for the newcomer to hit the zombie until it fell down, but when he looked at the zombie, he was scared and couldn't do it. Seeing this, Bo asked Ben to replace him, but he took the sledgehammer himself and said no, because everything was fine, especially since Ankawa had already killed today, this time it would be him. Clutching the hammer you swung and hit the zombie on the head with all his might sending the body down right onto the ladder that had been destroyed earlier. Looking at this, the sheriff asked if his friend was okay. He replied that he was fine, it was just a zombie, so let's get ready again. Holding the board, Bean thought about the fact that there were 23 zombies on the floor below, and 22 left. It's noon, the guys are still catching zombies and beating them on the head one by one, and you concludes that there are only 3 zombies left, which is good but it's getting harder to get in, and Bo and Sam are tired, so is there a way to do it faster? The friends ask Ben to call it a day, and he accepts the offer, putting down the hammer. While resting, he begins to say that this method is too hard for them. There are fewer zombies now, so it's easier to miss, and it's harder to attract their attention with noise. After hearing this, Bo suggests using the newcomer as bait, since he hasn't done anything useful so far, so now he has to contribute. Sick offers to think about it, but you already has a suggestion. Go downstairs. Hearing this, the newcomer waves him off saying that he must be crazy, he can go down if he wants to. Ankawa responds by rubbing the guy's head, saying that no one expects help from the newcomer. Meanwhile, Ben realized that it was dangerous, but not unexpected for him, and his friends supported his idea, saying that it would be interesting to try it, and they already knew the weaknesses of these monsters. Encouraged by this reaction, you began to stand up, saying that now they had the information, it would be easier than yesterday, so they should put on their gloves and get ready to go. After these words, Ben turns to the newcomer and scares him, telling him to stay here and help them up after they are done, that he can handle this kind of work. Hesitantly, the young man agrees. As the evening came, the group was already fully equipped and ready to go. As they carefully descended, the last thing they heard the newcomer say was that if they were bitten, he would not let them down. Looking at the place from which he had just ascended, an excited Bo wondered if he could trust the bastard at all. Also excited, Ben answered that the newcomer should understand that without a team, he was in danger. Meanwhile, Sam had already seen a zombie. There were two monsters on the floor, but the third was not visible. Ankawa went ahead and said that they had to get rid of these two first, and then the third one would appear. You tried to warn him about the plan, but it was too late. The sheriff stepped forward and called the pieces of shit to him to finish them off. One of the scum immediately started running at him. Swinging hard, Bo hit the zombie on the back of the head and sent it kissing the ground. Exhaling, the guy turned his attention to another monster that was already approaching him and hit it with a key with an uppercut. After that, he jumped up and fell right on top of the zombie, the hunter reflected in the eyes of the victim. With a victorious shout, Ankawa stabbed the key directly into the creature's head. When the sheriff comes down to the ground, he asks if they have found the last one. He replies that they haven't, and Sam says that the zombie is probably not even inside. After hearing the information, Bo asks his friends to stay close to him, because the bastard could be hiding anywhere. Suddenly, the group hears a sound behind the fence. Bean says that there might be more zombies behind the fence. The sounds continued, and the sheriff decides to go check it out himself. He opened the gate and started looking around, but didn't see anyone. Unexpectedly, his attention was drawn to the sounds of barbed wire. One of the zombies was stuck there and could not get out. Approaching the monster, the friends conclude that it must have been trapped when it was running around, but what's more surprising is that it doesn't make any sounds. Sick points and tells them to look closer. It seems that the wire has cut the woman's throat, so she probably can't scream. Looking at this, Ankawa says that he feels very guilty about the zombie grandmother, that he can't even move, let alone kill her. Approaching him, he says that he can do it himself, but Bo refuses, arguing that he has killed everyone himself and will kill her too. Then he takes a swing in front of his grandmother and ends her suffering. After this situation, 
then asks if his friend is okay. Ankawa clenches his fist with a helpless expression and says that from now on he will consider this cleaning up the only way to dehumanize them. A relaxed Sam says that Jean probably thinks the same way, because he looks like him. An irritated Ankawa turns around and asks why Six suddenly remembered about Noo. Now the guy is worried about him? Then replies that Jean is in the army now, so he probably kills even more zombies than they do. A war zone. The alarm sounded throughout the Corps. The commander ordered to act quickly and gather everyone on the parade ground. The captain continued to push the sacks of shit during the entire gathering time. All the soldiers ran to the exit in one column. One of the people in uniform was Park Jinu. He was looking at all this and realized that they were in deep shit. The soldiers were fussing all over the territory of the unit. Commanders were giving orders to their men to move faster. As he approached his group, Park heard the captain asking if the soldiers had received ammunition. This made him realize that they would actually be shooting. One of the soldiers introduced Jean to the captain, who in turn looked angrily at the latecomer and told him to stop cooling off, they didn't have time for that. Another soldier ordered Noon to go and get the magazines. As the lieutenant handed out the magazines, he told them to load one of them and keep the others safe. Taking one of the magazines in his hand, Pak saw Ray all live ammunition. The troops began to pack into cars, and then they all moved through the central gate with the guards. Sitting in one of these cars, Ji reflected on the fact that in other times they would have been caught up in real events. But now, the guy looked around at his neighbors and possible partners, and then turned his gaze to the commander, continuing his thought that everyone was worried except the commander, wondering what was going on. He was brought out of his thoughts by the voice of the sergeant next to him, who said that the situation was frantic, everyone was scared for some reason, and he had heard that several soldiers had already been killed. With that, the sergeant makes a face and says that the dead soldiers will now haunt Park for the rest of his life. This behavior scared not only Jean, but also the other soldiers in the truck. This cataclysm was stopped by a blow to the helmet of the prankster, who immediately began to make excuses that he only wanted to cheer up the younger men, because they were too scared. After that, the sergeant turned to Park again, acting innocent and saying that if he was a good sniper, he could shoot a ghost. Seeing the blood, G asked if his neighbor was okay. He took the guy's hand and said that he trusted him with all the ghosts. The commander who was watching thought that the sergeant was talking nonsense as usual, but he managed to ease the tension. Meanwhile, the soldiers picked up on the motive and started joking around with Puck, which made him smile broadly. However, it didn't last long. As the soldiers were driving away, they heard terrifying sounds from the city, which brought fear back to their faces. She checked his ammunition and wondered if this was a war or something like it. These thoughts caused him to panic. Arriving at the assembly point, the captain ordered the second squad to leave. When the commander came out, he immediately began to say that it was 1845 and that from now on there should be strict order. Upon hearing this, the lieutenant raised his hand for permission to ask a question about what was going on here. To which the commander replied that at this moment the town of Samchok was teeming with zombies. At first, the soldiers did not understand this news, asking if they had heard correctly. One of the soldiers began to joke that they were really stupid for believing this obvious drill. Listening to this, she thought that the atmosphere was too serious for a drill. Finally, the soldiers' doubts were dispelled by the sound of gunfire, which made them say that everything looked too real for a training, and the ammunition was live. Clapping his hands, the captain attracted the attention of his squad and said that this was not a training exercise, but a reality, they might not believe it, because the commander himself did not believe it at first. No one knows how and when the virus started spreading, but the fact is that the virus spread not only throughout the city, but throughout the country while they were talking. At this, one of the shocked soldiers raised his hand to clarify if he understood correctly that they had to kill zombies. In all seriousness, the captain replied that they would indeed have to kill the monsters and rescue the survivors. From such tension, one of the soldiers lost his nerve and started running, holding back his gag reflexes, and then fell to his knees, emptying his stomach. Meanwhile, the commander was already giving orders that they had little time. Now they needed to search Samchok and its surroundings. The city would be the center, so they needed to search the surroundings for survivors and the second group would inspect the buildings marked on the map. To this, the commander asked for a floor plan of the premises, because if they are too large, it will be difficult for his squad to search them. Meanwhile, he stood there thinking about the fact that their squad was the smallest, and they hadn't trained much. While he was thinking, the commander received more information about the mission, 
and then the manager said that he was ordered to stay here to see if other units were joining, so he would leave leaving the mission to the second squad. The captain was shocked that he now had to give orders himself. Pointing a finger at him, the manager confirms this, saying that he was appointed commander for a reason. Of all the soldiers behind the man, only Park looked ready. The captain finally agreed to do what he had to do, and he pleased the manager. Returning to his squad, the commander began to say that as they had already heard. He was not allowed to finish his sentence by the frightened soldiers who began to ask a lot of questions. Shouting at them to stop the noise, the commander lowered his head and continued to say that he knew they had never been in such situations before, so they were scared, to be honest, he was scared as fuck, but what would they do if their families were in the city? Would they still refuse to leave? Would they just stand there doing nothing? After this speech, the man turns to Jean to report. The young man replied that he was ready to leave at any moment. Putting his hand on his shoulder, the commander told him not to act tough. Seeing this, all the other soldiers, not wanting to be outdone by Pack, lined up to move and get it over with as soon as possible, but there were still those in the squad who were not fully confident. Looking at his men with satisfaction, the commander ordered the second squad to move forward. As night fell, the soldiers helped each other climb over the obstacle. When they reached their destination, the squad was ready to enter. Suddenly, one of the soldiers began to worry that it was too much, because they had no combat experience, but they still had to perform the task on their own. Turning to the frightened soldier, the sergeant said that there was nothing they could do about the fact that they were ordered to go. Their conversation is interrupted by a zombie scream, which makes them all crouch down. In this situation, the sergeant asks Commander Choi what they should do. The captain replies that they need to search the apartment and the neighborhood. No one is allowed to go far. They need to go to the White House in front of them at the end of the street. There are 10 floors in total, but it will take time to search them. First, they need to investigate the situation and then determine whether to split up or stay together. Hearing the order, the soldiers began to move to their positions. All except Jean, who was asked by the captain to stay behind and get ready to pull the trigger on command. With a serious look on his face, Park obeyed the order. Walking along the destroyed street towards the house, the soldiers saw the bodies of the dead and some of them still could not believe that they were seeing the dead in real life. Suddenly, something fell behind one of the soldiers, frightening the men. She concluded that it must have been something that fell as a result of the destruction, or someone who did not want to become a zombie. Unexpectedly, this something made noises, and one of the soldiers asked if they should go look at it. The captain replied that yes, but carefully. The soldier came closer and said that the body was still alive. He began to approach him to see if he needed help. Looking closely, the soldier saw a bite mark on the victim's leg, which in a second turned into a zombie attacking the nearest living creature. In fright, the soldier began to cover himself with his hands, which is why he was also bitten. Others who had been watching all this time began to panic and try to pull the out. Finally, having driven the monster away, the comrades began to make sure their partner was okay. Observing this situation, the captain remembers the manager's words that people can become zombies after being bitten and starts shouting for everyone to immediately move away from Soldier Lee. Meanwhile, monsters began to come out of the house. Looking at them, the soldiers were shocked to see real zombies. Excited, Choi gives the order to get ready to shoot, and then all the soldiers stand in a ready position. The zombies start running right at them. Finally, the phrase, fire, is heard. However, the bolts on the machine guns were not cocked. Seeing this, the commander shouts for the soldiers to set the mode of mass shooting in bursts. Meanwhile, Ji was thinking that he needed to breathe, calm down, and just do as he was taught. With these thoughts in mind, Park takes aim at the zombie, but sees it as a human being, which is why he can't shoot. Seeing this, the captain orders him to hurry up. Noon concentrates and makes a shot right at the zombie's head. After that, all the others also open fire, shooting at the monsters that ran directly at them. Firing their bullets, the soldiers could not understand why the enemies did not die. Remembering Ji's first shot, Choi shouts to the soldiers to shoot at the head. Aiming and firing, one of the soldiers thought it was easy to say shoot in the head when these bastards were running around like crazy. Suddenly, one of the hit soldiers falls down right in front of the monster, which did not wait long to attack. Fighting with an assault rifle, the guy tried to throw the creature away, but two more came to the monster's aid. Unexpectedly for the young man, bullets were already fired at the zombies, immediately burying them. The shots were fired by Choi, and the bewildered soldiers could only watch him, not knowing how to fight the zombies. Seeing this situation, the commander starts shouting for the bastards to not stand still, 
but to get ready to shoot. Zombies fell one by one from the soldiers' bullets. When they were done, one of the soldiers asked what to do with the bitten ones. The commander replied that they needed to gather themselves first. Meanwhile, the bitten man was slowly mutating into a zombie. Looking at the poor man, the soldiers panicked, and one of them said to leave the infected man alone. To which another replied that he should stop talking nonsense. But the fact that everyone saw Lee being bitten did not change, no one knew when he would turn. Kim couldn't accept the fact and just leave the bitten. However, Choi ordered him to move away, as he needed to remain cautious, call for reinforcements, and observe from a safe distance. Kim wanted to finally bandage Lee's wounds, but he began to convulse. After that, the soldier got up like a zombie and immediately attacked the nearest one. However, a second later he had a bullet in his head. Kim turned to his rescuer and saw Jean. The bewildered soldier sat in front of his dead comrade. Meanwhile, G was already running to see if Kim Na was okay, when he turned to him to thank him for saving him. However, Park told him to thank the captain, not him, and at the first sign of strange behavior, Choi ordered him to shoot. The commander himself hoped that Lee would not turn, but the worst happened. Meanwhile, Ji stood in front of the corpse and regretted what had happened. The voice of a soldier shouting that zombies were approaching brought everyone out of mourning. A wave of monsters ran straight for the second unit. Firing back, the soldiers buried one zombie after another, but they still ran right at them. And there was no end to them, so she wondered if they were going to accidentally run into the sounds of gunfire. But to stop shooting was to die. Suddenly, he heard cries for help. Some zombies had gotten to his friend's side. Aiming his gun, Park wanted to help, but he ran out of ammunition, so he took out a new horn and changed it as quickly as possible, and Noon started shooting zombies away from his partner, thinking that if there were so many in one house, what about the city? Standing in a ring, the second unit shot the scum around. Finally, having cleared the area and left a pile of corpses, the captain said that they had suffered one casualty, a soldier, Li Zhangdei, and two more wounded, Ku Bong Sin and Song Sin Ho. By wounded he meant bitten. Kim was puzzled by this news, Ji did not know what to do, but one of the soldiers suggested killing the wounded and leaving. Choi replied that everyone had seen the result of Li's bite, so there was no time to delay, otherwise everyone would be in danger, so he would do it himself. Hearing this, Ji was impressed by the commander. Against the backdrop of the night city, one shot rang out, followed by another. The soldiers were resting after the mission, and one of them began to say that they hadn't even entered the house yet, and already three people were dead. The other one ordered the bastards to stop talking. The radio operator tried to contact the headquarters, but he was unsuccessful. Meanwhile, Choi was thinking that there was no hope of returning, that they needed to split up and finish the search of the building as soon as possible. Then he ordered the radio operator to report back when he was done, and the others to split into three groups, the first one, Kim Jiho, Choi Kongshin, Park Jinu. The three of them have to search rooms 6 through 10, the second, Song Changil, Cho Sango. Yu Tae Sin will search the first floor in the backyard and then take care of the security. Those in the third group will go with him and search the second to fifth floor and then help the first group with the upper floors. After the order, the commander asked if anyone had any questions. But no one had any, and since they did, they were to divide into groups and follow the order. Approaching the elevator, Ji wanted to call it, but the captain stopped him, saying that they would use the fire escape to avoid getting trapped in the elevator, and it would be better to search the apartments using the doors as shields. Realizing the idea, Park immediately ran to fulfill his task, but on the way he wondered why the elevator did not go down. Was it broken? Approaching the door leading to the stairs, Ji noticed that usually at such moments something jumps out and began to open the door from which a zombie fell out. Frightened, the group immediately opened fire. But the corpse was already dead. Noon said, catching his breath, that he knew it would happen. Seeing this, the commander ordered to check the corpse. The soldier approached and turned the body over and reported that it appeared to be dead. Choi said that he still needed to shoot him in the head just in case. The private standing next to him began to point to himself, saying that he remembered exactly how he hit the zombie in the forehead. Kong Sin, who was checking the corpse, confirmed that the man was definitely dead. The group enters the staircase, but one of them stays for a few seconds in front of the corpse, suspecting something, but still decides to catch up with the group. Meanwhile, the zombie, who had been lying still until now, suddenly woke up attacking Khan, which is why he mechanically dodges the monster with his hands and swings his assault rifle, hitting the bastard in the head with the butt. 
repeating the procedure of the soldier, who still kills the creature. After that, he starts to catch his breath from the stress. Meanwhile, one of his comrades came to check why his partner was delayed, but when he saw the zombie, he understood everything, asking if Khan was okay. To which he replied that he was still putting his assault rifle back on. Because of this situation, Kim says that now they will shoot him in the head to be sure, but now they have to go. Heading for the entrance, Sung thinks that everything will be fine, hiding the scratch from the teeth on his arm. Approaching the emergency exit, the captain gives the command to split up from now on, saying that as they had decided earlier, his group would go down and Sergeant Kim's group would go up. They themselves must understand that the safety of the survivors is paramount. Meanwhile, Kong began to feel feverish, denying in his head that he was bitten. However, Ji had already noticed a change in his partner. At that moment, one of the group on the street called out to the sergeant to report a zombie. There was indeed a corpse on the road, and when Ji saw it, he asked where they were coming from. Ayu picked up the radio and wanted to report to Choi, but was unable to because of interference with the radio waves. At that moment, Kim picked up a radio in the building, and the soldier, fascinated by the device, began to resent the fact that the freaks from the street were not reporting to the channel. Suddenly, he realized that the radio waves hadn't worked before, so he tried to shout to the group on the street. But they didn't hear anything. Frightened, San suggests that they go inside the apartment, because if they stay here, zombies will come here. Suddenly, the radio starts making noise, and Sango orders them to turn it off quickly. However, the zombies' attention was already attracted, and they began to run at the soldiers. Seeing this, Cho simply decides to kill them all. When the first and third groups heard the shots, they were confused. Kim asks if they should go down. The captain replies that they should proceed according to the plan discussed earlier. Jiho starts to panic, saying that if the zombies attack again in a crowd, it will be dangerous for them. Turning to him, Choi says that they've been instructed to help, so they shouldn't spend too much time searching. Listening to their conversation, Ji thinks that the commander is right. They should finish the search as soon as possible, so they can return earlier. Realizing the situation, Kim repeats his mission, ordering the men to get up there quickly. The guys agree, and they all go to the 10th floor together. Looking after them, Choi wishes them good luck and orders his group to go down. On the way up, the sergeant asks Kong not to panic and to shut his mouth in a hurry. At this point, Ji looks at his partner, clearly noticing that something is wrong. Meanwhile, Sango was shooting at the zombies and couldn't hit them, firing bullets after bullets, one of which finally pierced the monster's head. After killing the monster, the private turns to his partner to show off, but the latter is in a stupor. Seeing this, Sanho asks why Teshin is so scared, to which he simply pointed his finger forward. Cho's own face began to break out in a cold sweat. A bunch of zombies were running from the street in front of them. The group immediately opened fire on them. While firing back, Cho suggested retreating to the apartment, thinking that the sound of the shooting would wake up the company, and if they returned to the apartment, they would be able to hold out. Supporting the idea, the soldiers began to run away from the chase, and while they were running, Tezen tripped over a ledge and fell in the middle of the road. Cho came back to pick him up and helped his friend up, while Xan was already running towards the entrance. As they approached the entrance, Sanho started shouting for Chongil to climb the emergency stairs on the left. The comrades ran into the building right behind the private who had run ahead earlier, trying to catch up. But Tsan, having entered the fire escape, closed the door behind him. With despair on his face, Cho looked at the entrance to the safe house closed in front of him. While Sango was trying to reach the traitor, Teshin was firing back at the pursuers. Listening to the entreaties, Tsan replied that if he opened it, everything would be over, so he could not open it, and those who had to survive would survive. After these words, the private began to rise, leaving his former partners behind. Turning to the horde of zombies, Cho says that he will kill Tsan even if he becomes a zombie and opens fire on the soil. The two soldiers are left alone against the monsters. The first to run out of ammunition was Yu, and the zombies did not forgive him for this mistake, attacking him directly on his fresh flesh. Falling down bleeding, the last thing the private saw was the sergeant's frightened face. The other creatures did not wait long to attack Cho, who decided to fight to the last. However, the apocalyptic world does not forgive mistakes. Zombies ate the body of Sanho, who was screaming in agony. Meanwhile, the first group reached the ninth floor and saw the elevator doors trying to close, but they were blocked by a zombie carcass without legs and arms. Seeing this, the sergeant concludes that this is probably the cause of the elevator breakdown, a disgusting bastard, 
for someone who cannot even move, he has a terrible character. With that, Kim orders the private to finish off the zombie. Kong was about to execute the order but was stopped by Jane, who said that it was not a good idea to shoot here, since the sounds of gunfire attracted the zombies to the first floor. Of course, this is not accurate, but still no need to take unnecessary risks. The sergeant agrees, saying that they can kill this zombie later if necessary, but if that's the case, they should start searching. At this point, Kong was looking at the zombie while continuing to hide his hand from his partners. The first group started searching, but no zombies were found on the 9th and 10th floors. Suddenly, Gene stopped in front of the window of the room from which the sounds were coming. Seeing that something was wrong with his ward, Kim asked what was wrong with the boy. He made a gesture of hush to his comrades, confusing them. Gently pushing the window open with the muzzle of his gun, Park began to look around the room and saw something striking. Approaching to see what was there, the sergeant was also stunned by what he saw. A baby was crying on a crib. It was the first survivor of the apartment. He entered the apartment and barricaded the door behind him. While the sergeant and Kong were searching, Zhu asked the boy questions. What was his name? How old was he? It turned out that the boy's name was Zhu Bin, and he was four. After this information was revealed, Park asked where Zhu's mother was. This question brought the boy to tears, which made him cranky. Hearing the child's crying, the sergeant took hold of his head, saying that he had been trying so hard to calm the boy down. Now let the privates do it, or the dead will come. None tried to calm the boy down, but in vain. At this point, Sin suggested that since the boy was alone, his parents must have been attacked by zombies. This assumption puzzles the sergeant. Excited, Ju asks him what they will do now, since it is too dangerous to take the boy with them during the search. Jiho agrees with the private, but it is unlikely that they will have a chance to return here, so they will have to drag the kid with them. Wiping the sweat from his forehead, Kong says that since nothing can be done about it, it's fine. And Ji offers to carry the boy himself. But the sergeant refuses to nominate Sung, since Park has to do the shooting, and says that he needs to write a note just in case the child is evacuated and to contact Sergeant Choi. After giving the task, the sergeant himself went somewhere. Noon asked where he was going. Kim replied irritably that he was going to take a leak. After writing the note, Ji thought that now all that was left was to call Sergeant Choi. While Kong was trying to entertain the child, Park took out his walkie-talkie and wanted to contact the commander, but he noticed a bite mark on his friend's hand. Immediately remembering Sung's strange behavior, the guy could not believe what was happening. Kong was distracted from playing with his child by a call to rank. When he came out of the restroom, the sergeant saw something shocking. Jean was holding his partner at gunpoint, asking about the wound on the back of Sin's hand. The latter, in turn, began to make excuses, saying that he did not know for sure whether he had received it during the battle. The sergeant wanted to check, but the enraged private brushed him off, putting the muzzle to the boy's head and ordering Gene to lower the machine gun, otherwise he would kill the child. Then the man started shouting again, ordering him to lower the gun. Watching this, Kim asks Park to lower the weapon. Reluctantly, the boy obeys the order. Trying to defuse the situation, the sergeant says that Kong should also calm down, as he was bitten by a zombie, but he still hasn't turned. These words make the man even angrier, and he starts shouting that no one bit him. Kim, obviously worried, agrees that Kong was not bitten and that he should put down his weapon. The man continues to shout and says that if he puts the weapon down, he will be shot immediately. The sergeant says he doesn't understand why he would shoot him. However, the man says that Kim probably thinks that the bitten private is trying to kill the child, so let him not jerk otherwise. The man could not finish his sentence, looking at the crying boy, he did not know what to do. Not finding anything better, Khan let the child go, who in turn ran to the sergeant. Running outside, the man just froze. Kim tried to call out to the private, but he started choking and vomiting something green. The sergeant called out a couple more times to his ward, but to no avail, and then turned his attention to Ji, who was holding Sun at gunpoint, asking the sergeant to move away. Looking at the exit, Kim could not believe it, the private turned into a zombie and began to run away from the soldiers with a terrifying scream. Saying that he was very sorry, Zhu fired a shot, which sent the man's blood flying around the apartment. After the incident, the sergeant asks if Zhu is okay. He says yes and asks how the boy is doing. Jiho says that luckily the boy was only slightly scared. Putting his hand on the shoulder of his ward, Kim says that he knows it hurts, but there is no time to beat himself up. Now we need to get out, so let's go. With that, the man approaches the door, but instead of leaving, he closes it and locks it. Ji wonders why he did that. 
The sergeant said that in front of the elevator park said that zombies are attracted to the sound of gunfire, which seems to be true. The corridor leading out of the apartment was full of zombies. Meanwhile, the third group was going down the stairs when they suddenly heard something. It was footsteps, and Sam was coming up from the bottom. When the shocked captain saw him, he asked what he was doing here. Catching his breath at the surprise of the other members of the third group, Chango replied that the zombies who had come to the sound had killed everyone. Sitting down with Song, Choi ordered him to report. The private began to say that there were about 20 zombies, maybe more now. Looking at the commander, Chungul thought that Choi couldn't possibly be lying, but the captain's piercing gaze was frightening. While the soldiers were sorting out the situation, the voice of an alpha came from the military phone, asking if Bravo was in place. At that moment, Kim was sitting on the 10th floor in one of the apartments, complaining that he was going crazy because he did not know the situation on the ground floor, could not use the radio, and could not even break through the pile of zombies. When the man turns his gaze, he notices that June is doing something and wonders what he is doing. The guy was looking through the peephole watching the zombies and counting something. When he counted to 50, he was convinced that everything was as he thought. Having finished watching, Park turned to Kim, who was having fun with the kid, saying that he had found a way to escape from here. It seems that the zombies move according to a certain pattern. It takes them 20 seconds to get to the front door, in general. It takes 50 seconds to go through once and come back. After listening to the information, Kim concludes that even if it is 50 seconds, they will only be able to move after the zombies have passed, so there will only be 30 or even 20 seconds left. G adds that this is enough time to get to the emergency exit. Turning his attention to the kid, the sergeant says that the problem isn't even time. Because of this situation, Park decides to go first to check the accuracy of his guesses, and if everything works out, let the sergeant follow him with the child. Jiho beats his private for daring to speak to the elders like that, saying that he will go first. To this, Ji warns that it could be dangerous. But the sergeant was determined, and he was also a good shot. Opening the door carefully, Kim ran out into the corridor immediately heading for the exit. Reaching the door, the man thought that the situation looks like this. If the street is further, then they can probably just walk through. Upon reaching the door, Kim gestured with his hand that the way was clear. Seeing this, Ji took the kid by the hand to go but the boy accidentally dropped the car, which fell to the ground and started playing music that made Kim and Park turn white. The zombies heard the sounds and immediately ran frantically in the direction of the noise.